If you haven't done so, make sure you pause the video and try to answer the question on your own first before listening on. We'll notice that all three charges in this problem are positive. And the reason that's important to notice is because we recall that for any positive point charge, the electric field that's produced by that charge is going to be pointing away from that charge. And so if we consider point P and the electric field that is produced by Q1, or charge 1, we would realize that that electric field would have to be pointing away from that charge. Now away from that charge would mean that the electric field would be pointing in this direction. and we could label that E1. Now, similarly, the electric field that's produced by charge 2 would be pointing away from charge 2, and that would be pointing in this direction, away from that charge. And what's interesting to note is that because Q1 and Q2 have these same values, and because these distances from each of the charges to point P are the same, that means that the electric field E1 and E2 are going to be exactly equal in magnitude, they're just pointing in opposite directions. So in other words, these two electric fields are going to cancel out, and so they will not be any relevance to our calculation of the total electric field. So what we're going to do is actually take out charge 1 and charge 2, since again their electric fields cancel out. And so only charge 3 is going to be producing a net electric field at point P. And again, since it's positive, that net electric field will be pointing away from charge 3, so it's going to be pointing in this direction. And our job is to find the magnitude and direction of that electric field vector. We can call that E3. Now, we know that for a point particle, the electric field is equal to a constant multiplied by the magnitude of the charge divided by a distance squared. Now, the distance would be from the charge to whichever point we are interested in, and in this case, that is point P. So the distance that we need in this equation is going to be this distance right here. We can call that R. And in order to find that distance R, we want to consider the isosceles right triangle that is present in this picture. We can see from the diagram that one leg of the triangle is A, and the other leg of the triangle, in fact, is also A. And it turns out that when you have an isosceles right triangle, the hypotenuse of that triangle is always going to be one of the legs multiplied by the square root of 2. And that is always true for any isosceles right triangle. Remember, isosceles means that the two legs are equal. So given that this hypotenuse is a square root of 2, if we look over here, that would be this distance from here all the way over to here. Now, point P is located exactly halfway along that hypotenuse. So that means that this distance here would be half of A square root of 2. And so we've labeled that distance accordingly. Now, we're going to use Pythagorean theorem to find this distance R, since we have a right triangle, a smaller right triangle, right here. So let's go ahead and apply Pythagorean theorem to find R. And so one leg of that triangle is r, so we would have r squared plus the other leg squared, and that other leg was a radical 2 over 2. And that's going to equal the hypotenuse squared, and the hypotenuse of this small orange right triangle is a. So we would have a squared. Now to simplify the expression in the parentheses, we would have to square the a, so that becomes a squared. The square root of 2 squared would just become... 2. And then in the denominator, we would have to square that 2 to make 4. Now this can reduce if we divide top and bottom by 2. This 2 will become a 1, and the 1 down here will become a 2. We can subtract both sides of this by a squared over 2. And so on the right hand side, we would have a squared over 2. Now we actually could solve this for r by taking the square root of both sides, but it might be more advantageous to leave this as r squared, and let's remind ourselves why that is. Recall that the electric field equation has r squared in the denominator, and since we've solved this equation for r squared, we can actually take this expression directly and plug that in for r squared. So our electric field would become k times q divided by 
a squared over 2. Now to divide by a fraction you can use something called keep change flip where you keep the numerator the same, you change the division to multiplication, and then you flip that fraction around. So that would become 2 over a squared. And so now to find the magnitude of this electric field, we can go ahead and plug in the known values. Recall that k has a value of 8.99 times 10 to the power of 9, and the unit of that is newton meters squared over coulomb squared. We have q, now remember we're using q3, the charge on particle 3, and that was represented as positive 2e. So we're going to have a positive 2 times e. Now e has a value of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And then we also have a factor of 2 in the numerator. And then we're going to divide by a squared. We were told that a is equal to 6 micrometers, but we better convert that into meters in order for the units to work out here. So 6 micrometers would be 6 times 10 to the negative 6 meters. And then we don't forget to square it. And when we plug that into our calculators, we should get about 160 newtons per coulomb. This is the final answer for the magnitude of the electric field at point P. And as for the direction, it's going to be useful to draw in a horizontal line that passes through point P. And the reason we want to do that is we can find the direction just by using a little bit of geometry knowledge. It turns out that if you look at that orange right triangle, we have that 90 degree angle. Recall that this itself was an isosceles right triangle. So that means that both sides are equal as well as both angles. So this would have to be a 45 degree angle right here. Now if that angle is 45 degrees, then this angle up here also is 45 degrees. And that's basically because you have two parallel lines that are cut through by a transversal. You recall from geometry when you have two parallel lines and then a third line cuts through them, whatever this angle is will be equal to that angle right there. So we can confidently assert that the direction of the electric field will be 45 degrees, and that would be counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. And there we have the direction of the net electric field. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video. If you liked it, please subscribe to the channel so you can stay tuned for similar videos. Remember that you can send in your own question to the email address shown on the screen, and I'll do my best to answer it on YouTube.